Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Mammal Week. Happy Mammal Week. Uh, I'm Zeb Soames, one of the patrons of the Mammal Society, and we're delighted to have you joining us for this webinar on mammals in our lives and landscapes. I'm joined by Dr. Steph Ray, who is the chair of the Mammal Society, an ecologist and the director at Nature Positive and the fine artist uh, Guy Troughton. Welcome, both of you. Hi, thank, thank you. you. Um, and we should say that Guy is joining us from Australia, which is uh, which is very exotic. I'm speaking to you from um, a very grey Islington. And where are you, Steph? I'm in Dumfries in Galloway today, and it's, it's looking reasonably sunny out there. Excellent. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, I suppose we should start off by just asking how, uh, how both of you got involved with mammals in the first place. Steph, let's start with you. Oh, OK, so right off the bat, I have to I have to own up to being the nerdy neurodiverse one. So I was probably an ecologist before I was a mammalogist. Um, I've always been interested in the <clears throat> the science of just the, how fantastic the way that nature works is. And I loved all of that logical sense of things like food pyramids and nutrient cycles and so on, probably from about you know getting a book out of the library at the age of eight about this kind of stuff. So I'm afraid it's not one of these romantic Gerald Dorrell type stories of skipping through the bushes, collecting beetles and so on. Um, then I studied zoology at university and I loved all the kind of numerical side of that and the, what underpinned all those just so stories about how nature worked. And, you know, I, I've always loved mammals. I'd have always picked mammals as my, my favorite animals and undoubtedly have a slightly weird obsession with aardvarks, but we don't need to go there necessarily. Um, so my mammal career could have ended then, but I was I, I was almost gonna do a PhD on sticklebacks uh, when I was offered a second studentship with Professor Stephen Harris at Bristol to study brown hares and their relationships with rabbits and muntjac and roe deer and everything else that lives in Thetford Forest. Uh, and then, you know, that really transformed me from a, a, a vague appreciation of mammals into into a career and a, a lifelong passion so you know I'll always be deeply grateful to to Steve Harris and the University of Bristol for that and we'll come back to that interconnectivity uh, of mammals a little later on and Guy uh, how do you get involved with 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 drawing and painting mammals yeah well I, I was probably the opposite of Steph and I was inspired by Gerald Durrell um <laughs> and I and I actually I did read all his books I have to say I did read all his books um, I was one of those kids who was just outside um, picking stuff up, uh, just really interested in everything I found, I mean, literally everything, not just mammals, not just birds, but just everything. And um, I was a bit nerdy. I would I would pick stuff up, take it home. I even got my mum involved. But she would pick up dead bodies for me. So it's a, it's a little, little bit, you know. With animal dead bodies, I think. Animal dead bodies. I think yeah. we should stress animal that. Not, not human ones, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> she, she, she was very understanding and she would, um, well, she never stopped me, put it that way. So that my, my bedroom was full of skulls and feathers and um, animal skins. And I was trying to do a little bit of amateur taxidermy when I was sort of like 10 or 11 years old. Um I don't know what my friends thought about me at the time doing all of that, but I was also trying to draw them. So I'd been drawing from the age of, I don't know, five, six years old, that sort of thing. Um, one of my earliest drawings was of a red deer, which I actually found in my mum's drawers just, just last year. And it was dated when I was six years old. So I was I was obviously into mammals from early on. Gosh, as, as well. You're known particularly for your bird pictures and, and why birds in particular what what led you more towards those I think it, it, it's a good question because um I think birds in art tend to be a little bit more um widespread than mammals should we say there's, there's a little bit more popularity um and before we did this 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 webinar I was thinking about that and and I think it's something to do with the with with birds being so much out there so that we can see all the time whereas mammals are often more hidden and and birds of course come in so many types um they're 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 colorful they're they're often just right there in front of us and and of course they're singing or calling or whatever it is 
Um, whereas mammals are more secretive, generally speaking. Um, like you, so I have. I, I had a bit of a Gerald Durrell childhood, so I also read my. In fact, <laughs> I my family and other animals on a holiday in Corfu, and at the, <laughs> the story where he describes that. Um, winter comes and a storm almost like god flicking a switch it happened exactly at that time when i was there on a holiday and the sky went black and the storm rolled in but when i was a child we had at peak um three dogs two cats two hamsters 20 guinea pigs because you know how fast they breed um four <laughs> rabbits and a tortoise called fred who i still have he was my third birthday present but i used to collect snail uh, collect snails and 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 observe them and i had a wormery and i was just fascinated by nature and life and yeah. uh, and i remember charging my neighbors 5p i think to come in and look at the animals for charity so um, <laughs> um so that was my childhood with nature Excellent. Um, but steph why do why do mammals matter um why do they matter wow well i mean Start, first of all, like we as humans, they just do, don't they? We we can't we can't get away from the fact that mammals and all of nature matters. But I suppose as an ecologist, we we like to look at the roles that different species play in the ecosystem. So you know, a vole might function as as food for for a fox, for example. Um, a, something like a wolf has a function in regulating, say, deer numbers, um, which stops them getting overpopulated. And then you've got things like beavers, which are absolute ecosystem engineers and can entirely transform the habitats around them through through their, their modification of habitats that slows down water flow, it sequesters carbon and so forth. And, and we tend to call those things that, that nature provides ecosystem services um, because, well, you know, economics, uh, we, like to, we like to put names on these things. And, and when you look at that, well, nature provides everything, everything that we need free at the point of delivery. Uh, it's just humans that mark up the price at various points in the interaction. So, so nature provides us with, with provisions like food and fiber and fuels you know, services like clean water, a regulated climate that we can all survive in. It's all coming from, from natural processes and, and the basic building blocks like soil and habitats that the whole caboodle rests on. That's all provided by nature. Even things, even things like education and, and art and culture and spiritual aspects, we're getting, we're deriving all of those benefits from nature. And mammals have roles in, in all of those aspects, really. You know, for, for me, one of the most interesting roles of mammals in, in providing for humans is, is um, about climate regulation. And, and it's not necessarily what you expect. People think of climate and they think about planting trees to offset um, carbon emissions. But the large bodied mammals, things like elephants, um, not only sequester lots of carbon, they've got large bodies and they're long lived, but they also manage the habitats around them. The way they modify the habitats around them is important in, in managing that relationship and helping us keep a survivable climate. So a live element, elephant, even in, in cold, hard financial terms, is worth hundreds of times more to humanity alive and doing all that fantastic stuff than killed for its ivory. Plus, you get to have elephants in the world. So, mm -hmm. you know, these, these are really no, important it's services. That you're, you're quantifying the financial value of an, yeah. of an elephant. But this is a very important part of the work that you do, um, telling businesses why they should care about mammals. So tell us a little bit more about how you convince big businesses of the importance of, of mammal conservation. Well, we start with understanding where a business is now, what it does, and therefore which of those sorts of services that we've just talked about it relies on, where, where it needs something like a, a, a natural resource or a clean water supply to carry out its process or whatever, um, and where it can potentially have impacts on nature. And with that, mammals are really helpful in that conversation because they're, they're lovely flagship species, aren't they? You can, you people can can understand an elephant. They, they find it harder to understand soil microbes, 
but you can understand an elephant. You can see if your business is affecting an elephant. So for example, um, if we're working with clients who have elements of coastal impacts or a lot of shipping involved in what they do, then you know we might look at, at, at sea mammals. We might look at the great whales, for example, and they're they're hugely important, not just in their own right and the you know what they do for us in terms of, of recreation and enjoyment of just seeing whales, but they they have a fantastic role in, in regulating the climate. Again, not where you immediately think of, um, but but the, the great whales, because they, they migrate up and down the water column, um, and then they migrate long distances around the globe, they're moving nutrients around. Those nutrients are, are causing the phytoplankton, the tiny little um, uh, plants in the sea, to, to bloom and increase in numbers. That's helping to fix carbon dioxide, to generate oxygen like all plants do through photosynthesis. And so we're actually sequestering carbon through the movement of whales. So if we care as a as society about climate change and we want to we want to sequester more carbon, we want to, to improve the health of the oceans, then just allowing whales to increase in numbers from where they are now, a little over 1.3 million to where they were before the days of whaling, maybe four or five million animals, then the, the impact on climate would be the equivalent of four more Amazon rainforests. Now, and that's an incredible contribution. That's what mammals are doing and could do for us if we just left them alone to get on with it. And what's, what's the hardest uh, sell you've had to do on this to big businesses, uh, you know, to convince them of this value? Um, I think I can normally bring things back to the, to the cold, hard economic facts. Because if you're a business and you rely on some of these things, then it's not just about a philanthropic interest. It's not just about doing the right thing. The point is that if you rely on a service from nature and through our mishandling of natural resources, that resource is getting in shorter and shorter supply, that's actually a business risk. Where will your business be in 10 years time if you don't have access to lithium, steel, whatever it might be? If you don't have enough clean water available to run your process for your factory, what will you do? What will you then sell? And that can help businesses to think about it in a different way around value engineering their process or looking again at what they use and how they use it and can they be more efficient. And sometimes, you know, the changes that we're making are helping people to be more efficient, potentially more profitable. It's not just about don donating to a cause. It's not let's conserve mammals. It's like, let's just think about how we do business differently and take into account our real costs and our real impacts across things that perhaps traditionally have been thought of as externalities. And Guy, you're in the business of um, capturing our wildlife mm -hmm. on canvas and paper. What are the cultural benefits of mammals? Good question. Um, we've, we've touched on it already, I think. Um, there, there is um there is a spiritual element to the natural world and steph's talking about the the economic side and and the importance to ecosystems but there is a there is a massive element of it which is just part of the fact that we are as humans we are part of that natural world too and so much of modern society has seen us divorce ourselves from that we we live in in buildings where we separate it and we we don't like the idea of the natural world coming into our homes um in fact i did an exhibition several years ago which i called crossing the line which was all about animals coming into the house um and just sort of just the whole idea of that confrontation so if if a fox walks in to your house you freak out if a bat flies in through the window you freak out but outside those are fine there's no problem at all and and i think it's there's something to do with this very primal connection that we have um from my own personal viewpoint i i think there is just a, a love um of the natural world and and just the, the beauty of it um just 
the, the fact that it's evolved to what it is now. When I started on all of this, I was acting like a scientist and I wanted to capture everything. So I, I wanted to get every feather on a bird right. I wanted to get all the fur on a mammal right and, and do it, do it, you know, which is why I was talking before about actually handling specimens. Um, but as time has gone on, I have seen the artistic side of it as well. And I think the, the, the artistic part of, of natural history painting is a huge thing. And, and it's actually just grown since I've been alive. There used to be a handful of artists who were doing that sort of thing. Nowadays, there are so many potential wildlife artists out there. It's it's a massive thing. So there's definitely something which is, um, yeah, it, it sort of it nurtures us. It's a spiritual thing. And of course, painting is very different to taking a photograph because you're spending a great deal of concentrated time focusing on whichever creature or bird you happen to be depicting. So yeah. that give you a very intense involvement with the subject. It's, it's wonderful. Um, it, it's a total immersion in doing it. Um, so for, for a one off, you, you know, the, there's, a, there's a certain amount of it, but I, I've done books which are whole monographs on certain types. Um, and I, in order to do that, I had to get to know those species. Um, and working with authors who did know those species meant that they would just turn around to me and say, that does not look right, start again. Um, and and it's, it's absolutely right. There is, there is just this way of every individual creature, the species, um, how it looks, how it feels, how it moves. And that's the difficulty and the challenge, I think, when you're doing illustration is to try and get hold of that. Um, it's 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 fun. It's exciting, and it's bloody hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what's the most difficult animal to draw? Oh, I don't think it's any particular difficult one. But I will tell you that there was um there was a time when I had to do the bats of Southeast Asia, and some of those bats um, had been described by an American guy, Charles Francis. For the first time, some of them had never been illustrated, not even photographed. And he was giving me all these, these instructions on how I had to put this bat together, which included things like how the, the fur had four different color bands down it. And how are you, how are you supposed to illustrate that? <laughs> So, Sarah, Bra Sarah Brabin has just sent a message to say this is really speaking to her because she's a wildlife sculptor. Well, um, you know, right. I, I write books about foxes and my illustrator, James Mayhew, says, and he's a very accomplished illustrator, been doing it for over 30 years, but he says the back legs of foxes, oh, yes. they'll almost yes. do anything to avoid drawing the back legs. So there must be all sorts of yes. tricks. For, I suppose hiding animals in water must be an obvious one. <laughs> yeah and anything at all <laughs> yeah anything to hide feet <laughs> it's always feet isn't it feet are really it's, it's always, yes people as well it's just people. <laughs> but, um, um, i'd say badgers people have a lot of trouble with you see a lot of pictures of badgers and a lot of them are are sort of oddly shaped somehow but maybe that's just because i see a lot of badgers in real life and i'm pickier about what badgers should look like yeah, well, they're, they're planty great feet, aren't they? As opposed to the fox when you're sort of up on its toes. So it's it doesn't feel right half the time when you do that. And they're quite sort of big, flat things, bear-like, aren't they? <laughs> you, Guy, you talked about the kind of spiritual aspect of yeah. things with animals. And, you know, without just kind of sounding too woo-woo, um, <laughs> I know exactly what you mean because of my observation of foxes, urban foxes. And, I mean, I saw, I counted eight on the garage roofs just outside my kitchen uh, yeah. morning. And sometimes when I'm cycling home from work, which is very late at night um, from radio studios, I'll see a fox in the street and I will always stop on my bicycle and get low down on the ground. And it's just that moment of grace and connection between a completely wild animal. And you're just kind of inhabiting that space together and sometimes that can be 20 minutes for me until something else mm -hmm. takes their attention and it's almost as if time stops and when you live and work in a very busy city like London having those moments in nature is you know we talk about mindfulness a lot 
but it's the most wonderful sensation of being reminded that you know there's this entire ecosystem that we are just we are a tiny part of and uh, and when i'm talking to children about foxes in particular it's reminding them of this interconnectivity and steph you were talking about that right at the beginning about how important it is to to remind people of you know how everything has an influence on on everything else Mm. absolutely I, it's so important i think to 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 get that connection with nature you know guy said you know we're part of nature we're not apart from it and and mammals are a really useful link into that to 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 catch people's attention and to to bring them into feeling that sort of kinship with nature because they are our closest animal relatives and i think when we see that we most people think a baby mammal is cute don't they? You know, you see a little, a little tiny baby rabbit or a deer. People think it's adorable, and and they recognise because they recognise us. We recognise ourselves. You know, the 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 head that's slightly large in proportion to the body, the big baby eyes. Those are features that are you know hardwired into our hind brains to say that's a baby animal. Take care of it. That's a baby. Mm. And, and so we, we feel that on a really primal level, it's not something we're consciously thinking about. It's just, we, we relate to them, but we, we sort of shut ourselves away slightly in our, in our cities and in our digital world. And we don't, we're, we're not seeing enough of that connection in real life for people to experience that connection with nature. Although I think, I think, I think sorry, Guy. I was going to say, I think that's one of the, the big differences between birds and mammals, that um, with, with birds, we, we see them almost decorative. Um, they might impact on us a little bit, but they're, but they're pretty um, and, and they do amazing things and they can fly. But mammals, because they're so much closer to us, they, 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 they do have that, that bond with us. And quite often when we see them, it's, it's a rarer thing than it is when you see birds. And, and as you said, Seb, that, that sort of intimate moment with a fox um, or, or in fact, any, any, anything else. I mean, I, I, had a little, I had a little possum in the studio here the other day. <laughs> it came in through an open window, a little ringtail possum. And, and of course, it wanted to get out. But there was a moment there where it actually just climbed up my easel and sat on the top. And, and the two of us sort of went, OK, what are we going to do now? <laughs> and, uh, and it was just it was so adorable um so wonderful and i didn't actually want it to go but of course I have to get it outside <laughs> but it's but it's that special little moment and i don't think you get the same thing with birds at all yes becky on the chat is just talking about that moment of connection so it is just those fleeting moments where worlds collide isn't it mm. and are, are, are so special but um Steph you touched on technology but I actually think you know the fact that everybody now has a camera in their hand means that it's much easier to to capture and share images of wildlife and the Mammal Mapper app of course is is brilliant for that I know lots of people uh, are tracking and recording um mammal species with that and we hope that you continue to do that and um, but what are, what are your favorite landscapes for um observing uh wildlife um let's start with you guy i mean you you're the other side of the world from me so is that your favorite place australia I, no no i wouldn't say that i i've been here for a big chunk of my life now um so the last few years it, it has all been australian and i've had to get used to the fact that it has been this sort of very different bush because it's called bush here um just just walking through trees it's it's much more open it's um all, all the all the plants are sort of spiky and um just the the feel of it is so different from a european woodland um and personally i just adore woodlands uh, I, you never know what you're going to see around the next tree or up above you down on the ground i, I think woodlands are just are truly amazing um, but of course, I was brought up in in England, and I've got lots of great memories of just stalking deer and seeing foxes and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I'd probably go for a woodland if I was going to pick anything out as a favourite thing. 
I think it would be the coast. I was brought up on the Suffolk coast in Lowestoft, and that's still my mm. favourite place, I think. I mean, we see adders basking in the summer and, uh, and of course, seabirds and the occasional seal. And it's, yeah, and the, so, yes, the coast very much is is in my heart. But, Steph, is it is it Scotland for you? Um, oh, there are so many places that are important to me in terms of mammals. I, I mean... I've I've worked in in the Comoro Islands in the Indian Ocean, working on on Livingston spruit bats. So one of the rarest bats in the world. So there's you know fantastic little pockets of of tropical rainforest on almost vertical mountain sides. Um, uh, there's a there's a place in in Australia. Actually, I shouldn't pick an Australian one. That's not my <laughs> that's not my lane. But, uh, <laughs> but where where Guy and I have actually been together in in Queensland and seen um platypus feeding and the azure kingfishers dropping down and catching fish that the platypus have disturbed and making away with them so that that's a particularly impressive memory i love seeing seeing ecology in action if you like seeing those interrelationships between species but i'm i'm very fortunate that i've just got back from a couple of weeks in california so at the moment i am all about sea otters uh, mm-hmm. I'm absolutely, I, I'm absolutely obsessed. I was lucky enough to be standing on a shore and being able to see a raft of sea otters with pups, probably no more than about twenty yards away from me, and just sitting watching them and the little little baby sea otters mucking about um, is just, it's just such a privilege and such. That there's nothing like it. I mean, I, I I ended up leaving that town sort of four hours late because I couldn't do anything else but stand and watch sea otters <laughs> well we're going they to be the most dense fur of all mammals i think don't they <laughs> we're going to be taking your questions very very shortly um so please uh if you have got anything for steph or for guy or for me um do drop us a line in the chat and remember to tell us where you are watching us from today because we we love to know how wide the webinar is is reaching. We had a question from Caroline asking what was the name of the app I was talking about. It's the Mammal Mapper app. You can find all the details on the Mammal Society website. It's absolutely fantastic. It just lives on your phone. And whenever you see um, a mammal, uh, you take a photograph and it will track exactly where it is and it helps to give us a really clear picture of mammal numbers so we would love you or it's you know if you're out on a walk um or on holiday it's 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 a great thing to have and to if your children have smartphones to encourage them to engage with it too so do we have any questions coming in well i'm just going to browse the chat for a moment While you're looking, I would just say that the drawing of mammals was quite possibly the very first thing that humans did in terms of making marks which were recognisable. If you think about the cave paintings in France, you know, which go back, what, 35,000 years, something like that, there's clearly something fundamental in our psyche which says we want to capture and record. What would be your advice, Guy, to anybody who um, perhaps is just starting out drawing uh, wildlife? And uh, Mm. what would be your top tips for them? Because some people might get very easily defeated, uh, particularly if they're struggling with some of those features we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I started off making some of these mistakes myself because I would take photographs and then try and draw from photographs. Um, and it does not work. You get you get a lot of information from a photograph, but you don't get to understand the animal itself. So my my absolute prime advice would be to go and see the real thing, whether whether it's a captive one or in the wild, wherever it is, and just do your best to start with. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're going to capture the animal properly, really well and in detail and all that sort of thing. It's all about making some marks because those those marks that you put down are going to give you a lot of mental information, not necessarily science information. Great Um, question for you, Guy, from Alice, hmm. who says, I'm wondering if there's a mammal uh, Guy hasn't yet depicted and that he would like. (laughs) 
Oh, uh, how many mammals are there? About 5,000 odd species. <laughs> so, or yes, is, there, or is, there a, is there a place on Earth that you haven't yet got to? Oh, yes. I, just, I, I have traveled a fair bit, but um, there, were, there were so many, so many. Um, most of Africa I've never been to. Um, I, I can't even begin to start to answer that question at all. It's in in my lifetime I've concentrated in terms of mammals uh, mostly on British ones, a few European, but mostly British. And even then, I probably haven't done all them properly. Uh, here's a question for you, Steph, which is from uh, D. Ackley. If you see a mammal or any animal in distress, should you try to rescue it or leave it and let nature take its course? Oh, that's such a difficult question, isn't it? The only the only possible answer to that is really it depends on, on what we mean by distress. If we think that it's something that can be readily resolved there and then, then, of course, I would suggest helping it. I would suggest, you know, giving animals water when needed and things like that is absolutely fine. Um, when we take wildlife in to um, the to into rehabilitation centers and so forth it's a very mixed bag some some centers have great track records in in rehabilitating animals but we have to be realistic about how well they might survive once released and there are problems around being able to release wild animals back into into nature because of the need for disease screening and so forth. So it is a hugely complicated issue. Um, you know, I'm probably like the person who wrote the question a little soft hearted and, and struggle to leave an animal in distress. I'd always want to, want to do something about, about it, but sometimes that, you know, that might mean euthanizing the animal, sadly. Yes. Um, a question from Maxine. Um, I'm an ecologist working in London. It's great to hear from Dr. Ray. It can mm -hmm. be challenging to match the economic and ecological factors. Uh, are there any projects coming up that we should take a look at as an example of excellent ecological development? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, I probably don't want to name any individual projects, but I would say that what we're what I'm seeing is largely around developments at a corporate level rather than at a project level. So I tend to work with organizations that want to improve their whole supply chain. So transform the way they are working with local farmers. So we're getting more regenerative agriculture so that when they're getting the materials they need from nature, they're not depleting the soil, they're putting back to the soil, they're giving back more than they take away. And it's that kind of systems thinking that's starting to creep into business that I think is, is where this is going really well. In terms of projects at, at a sort of an, you know, an, a site level, I think there's probably a bit more to do there because we do tend to, when we work on projects, if we're doing environmental impact assessment, we tend to think about what's on that site and immediately around it. We don't necessarily think about the whole supply chain of that project. You know, where's the timber coming from to, to build this development? Where's the, where's the aggregate? Where's the cement coming from? You know, and, and really digging into where are we actually having an impact on nature? Because our biggest impact might not be on the arable field that we've just built houses on, for example, which might have been really quite devoid of wildlife, depending on how it was being farmed beforehand. So I think it's, yeah, what, what excites me about projects is that wider thinking about where impacts are and how we're really interacting with nature. A great message. We were talking about the Mammal Mapper app and how great that is. And Jenny Higgs, uh, and I'm very deliberately using her full name, has sent this message to say, hello, I work at Worcestershire Biological Records and we download records from the Mammal Tracker app. They're really useful and can help aid wildlife conservation. But a big favour, it would be great if when using the app, you could use your real name, at least an initial and surname, to make it a valid entry for our database. And that was followed up by Ro, who said... Um, uh, so many people use a pseudonym. It is not a viable record if you don't use your real name. So if you use the app, please use your real name. Uh, Guy, this is uh, probably a question for you, and it's from Nicola. She says, I worry that TV shows and the Internet are really great at raising awareness of mammals. 
but they may give people unrealistic expectations about what sightings may be like for average people. What's your view on that? Sightings might be like every sighting is going to be different, isn't it? Um, I mean, you could possibly be able to get as close as a telephoto lens, I suppose. That's probably what she's getting at. Well, yeah, yeah. okay. So um, th these days, like a lot, a lot of bird watchers will be um, going out with a telephoto lens rather than binoculars these days. Um, and I, I used to do it just with a sketchbook. Uh, I didn't even take binoculars when I was going out for that. So, so that I could just draw something spontaneously when I saw it. So if I saw a roe deer on the other side of a field, I could just jot something down really quickly and just get an idea of it. But at the same time, you get those um, those encounters which just happen. And you could just be sitting having your lunch on a rock somewhere and suddenly an otter walks up to you or something like that. And those are just magical. Um, and you don't want to record and you can't. You can't move. You just wait and you just have those, like you with the foxes, you just have those moments. Um, so I, I'd say every single experience with an animal is going to be different and uh, you should never prejudge what it's going to be. Uh, Steph, Danielle Fry says it's easy to feel despair in this age of biodiversity collapse. What one mm. or two things could anyone do that will have the greatest positive impact currently? Um, one or two things, right. Mm. Well, I'd say the biggest the biggest driver of, um, of biodiversity loss is probably our food system globally and the sort of huge growth of commodities. So massive scale growing of soy to feed cattle in feedlots so that people can have cheap beef, for example. So, so both, and I don't want to make this biodiversity collapse issue p individuals problem. It's not your individual fault and responsibility, but what we can do as individuals is send messages to those big corporations that are driving the deforestation caused by soy production, for example, um, by saying, we don't want that, by choosing differently. Let's choose better quality, if you eat meat, better quality grass-fed meat and have it less often rather than having cheap beef very regularly. So you can make changes to your diet that will be both healthy for you and will, will send that message back to corporations that we don't want that. We don't want you, not in our name, do we want deforestation of the Amazon and the Cerrado so that we can have a hamburger, thank you very much. So there's, there's simple choices like that, not using single use plastic, just get it out of your life and your home. Um, and, and the biggest one that most people can do, and it doesn't sound like it's connected to mammals at all, is think about where you invest. If you have, if you're lucky enough to have any savings or a pension fund, then ask hard questions about what it's invested in. Because even if you only have a tiny amount of money, when it's amassed up with lots of other people's pension contributions, that's driving what we want the world to be like. And if we're asking for that to be invested ethically and not into things that drive climate change or drive biodiversity loss, that's curiously where you can have one of your biggest impacts. It's very difficult to find uh, supermarkets, I find in London, that don't wrap individual well, pairs of yeah. apple in plastic. <laughs> My father went into his local supermarket, which will remain nameless, but is, is, is two letters <laughs> and green. And uh, he said, uh, he said, why can't I buy a single cabbage that isn't wrapped in plastic? He said the outer leaves protect it. Yeah. And uh, they said, oh, we tried that, but we had so many complaints that they were dirtying people's shopping bags. Well, a shopping bag is meant to be dirty. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, they had tried, but yeah. it's, it's very, very difficult. And I tried to go to kind of little corner shops to get my fruit and vegetables so that it isn't in plastic, but we need to encourage other people to do the same. Uh, we've got another question here from... Uh, where are we? Uh, no, sorry. Talk among yourselves. I'm just going <laughs> to find that one. 
Oh, yes, volunteering. Be- Be- <laughs> Becky would like to know. Um, I recently broke my foot and I'm relearning to walk. Um, well, I hope you get better soon, Becky. Is there any volunteering option that you can do from home? So, yes, if people aren't as mobile, Steph, what would the Mammal Society like them to contribute? Um, there are lots of things that you can still get involved in from the, the comfort of your own armchair until you get better. So, yeah, please do contact the Mammal Society and um, we'll be able to put you in touch. We have various committees involved in fundraising, involved in in the science behind mammal conservation. Uh, and so we can we can certainly we can certainly connect you with those people who can help. There's things around around our communications and social media. There, there are projects going on that are desk based, things like checking identification records from photographs and so on. So there's lots that you can do. And please, anyone who's interested in getting involved in supporting the society, do get in touch. We've had another question about the Mammal Mapper app. Um, I've not used it before, but I wonder if the records are safe from people who wish to harm mammals, foxes, for instance. I know that hunters and poachers in other countries have used sightings records to track them. Perhaps this doesn't happen in the UK. And I've just had a message back from the Mammal Society to say, records submitted to the Mammal Mapper are not immediately publicly accessible. We pass them through iRecord for verification, and then they go to the NBN. But through this process, blurring is put in place for any protected species who could be threatened by their locations being made public. Mammal Society serves the data under license for responsible conservation purposes only. So there you are. It is quite safe to use the Mammal Mapper app. Um, is there can, anything that can be done about people's attitudes with regards domestic pets effect on wildlife, Steph? This must be a big issue for particularly people who are walking their dogs in the countryside. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are there are sort of there's two schools, isn't there? There's the, there's the very responsible pet owners who are who clean up after their dogs and who um, who always keep their dogs on a leash when they're going through past wild wildlife and through livestock um and then there are people who seem to think that their dogs have a right to roam like anyone else and charge about the countryside unimpeded um it is problematic we do see um a, a number of wildlife injuries every year caused by dog attacks they go less well reported than when dogs attack domestic livestock um but they're probably having a far more significant effect when you think about the relative numbers um, and also there are issues with diseases from when you don't clean up after your dog, there are parasites which will cause um, spontaneous abortion in things like um, sheep and deer. So um, it, it is something to be to be really aware of. And um, there are some projects ongoing. The Mammal Society has been involved in a project looking at interactions between dogs and wildlife. And we've been asking people to, to send us information about, you know, when their dog you know, meets a fox, what happens and so forth. And there are a couple of studies that have been done on that. So I think it's a really interesting area we, that we have a very high level of pet ownership in this country. And um, I think it's it's something we need to study in more detail exactly how we manage that. It's one of those terrifying stats, isn't it? When you look at the biomass of all of the mammals in the world, there's most of them are, are people and animals kept by people and there's some like four percent of all of the biomass of, of mammals in the world is all of the rest of the species of wild mammals so we are dominating far too much and just the existence of so many people with their livestock and their pets is completely unbalancing some of our ecosystems and and well, here of course in australia we we have a massive problem with feral cats and dogs uh, it's just huge. It's estimated that somewhere around three to six million feral cats in Australia. Yeah. And um, you, you know how sensitive the, the Australian mammal fauna is here. And it's um, we've got the highest rate of extinction as a result of that. So it's a it's a huge problem. Laura in the chat has just said we used to have a cat and would only let her out after she'd been fed and not at dawn or dusk. I try to encourage other cat owners to do that, too. Well, 
we've got time for just a few more questions and uh, we want to try and keep this a fairly tight chat so that anybody who watches this back later um, gets the most out of it. So please have a really good think about anything that you would like to ask Guy while we have him on the line from Australia. And I must say that Millie says, Guy, that as an Australian living in the Scottish Highlands, she really loves the painting on show behind you. <laughs> So have a think about it. <laughs> Whilst you do that, I'm just going to tell you about our other webinars which are coming up this week. And they are uh, tomorrow at 12 noon UK time with the Bat Conservation Trust Project Night Watch. And that's all about bringing bats to urban audiences. So do tune in at 12 noon tomorrow for that. And then on Friday, we're going to be talking about ethical photography. And that's with Susan Young and Danny Connor. So eth ethical photography, how to have the minimal impact on the subject that you are photographing. That's at 12 noon on Friday. Bob says, I'm completing a college thesis uh, and wondering if anyone has any knowledge about how urbanization and fragmentation affects hedgehogs and the effect on the decline of hedgehogs. So do we know how urbanization is affecting hedgehogs? Well, I think they've had a huge study in that, Steph, haven't we? Yeah, there's been a lot of research into, into hedgehogs in, in urban and semi-urban environments and going back a very long time. So there's a huge body of data there when you get your literature, literature search done. Um, but if there's anything that you, any specific questions that you have that you'd like help, send an inquiry through to the Mammal Society Inquiries line. Well, thank you very much uh, for tuning in and joining us wherever you've been uh, watching this webinar today. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the rest of Mammal Week. Uh, Guy, thank you so much for joining us from Australia and for demonstrating your beautiful artwork behind you. <laughs> and Steph, thank, thank you. you to our chair. It's wonderful uh, to have you sharing your expertise and knowledge um, with us uh, so comprehensively so thank you do follow the mammal society website and do join the webinars that we have coming up for the rest of this week and download the mammal mapper app safe in the knowledge that your data is going to help the mammal society protect the uk's mammals um, further thank you very much indeed bye-bye mm -hmm.